Hello, my friends. My name is Timothy Nelson, and I serve as Artistic Director of InSeries, and I am so pleased to be joined today by Maestro Stanley Thurston. Uh, Maestro Thurston has a long history with InSeries, and many of you may have seen him uh, even as recently as last year with uh, L'Enfance de Christ, which he conducted, or the year prior when we saw him, his stylings on the keyboard in From U Street to the Cotton Club. Um, Stanley, you, uh, you have uh, one of the most diverse careers, I think, in Washington. I, your fingers are in lots of pies. Um, most recently for InSeries, you appeared as conductor of Heritage Signature Corral just this past Friday with a concert that you were so kindly uh, agreeable to put together um, for us. And I wonder if, we, if that might be a good place to start, if you might tell us a bit about your uh, work at Heritage, which is, which is really your baby. You created it from the ground up and, and the work that, that you do there. Uh, and, and just to say that that concert remains available uh, in, 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 the, uh, in the theaters on InVision this week, and then for the rest of the month in the stage door. So, so it'd be great, I think, for us also to have a, a greater insight into that program and, and to what people can look forward to. Great, thank you, Timothy. Great talking with you. Yeah, the Heritage was kind of the, um, the thread that was running through my kind of performance career here in DC once I finished college and came over to Washington. Um, it is a group that I started mainly because of uh, all the singers and artists that I had come to know through college and folks that were performing at the Kennedy Center. I was working there when I finished school and got to meet all these great performers that a lot of people didn't know about. So I said, well, we need a platform where, where we can hear these performances. And of course, also coming from a HBCU program, became very aware of all these art, these compositions by Black um, composers that were new to me in you know, these oratorios and cantatas and symphonies like where no nope, these are not being performed so I said why don't we create a, an organization that would put that at the mission to actually present those kinds of programs with artists of color primarily and that's just kind of how I got started it was really just like this wealth of information this wealth of material which just needs somewhere to go um, and I'd sort of kind of my background sort of brought me through piano and of course then study conducting and study opera. So I had all these sort of tentacles of, of ways to present it and just liked working with people and with artists. So we started here at the Corral 20 years ago. And um, what you heard in the, in the performance a few days ago was actually a compilation of some years of performing. We did a um, 2018 concert featuring women composers called Women's Works. Um, and that was where we featured quite a bit of the music. Uh, but even some of that music came from other people that I had worked with prior to that. Issei Barn, we did a piece by Issei Barn. Of course, she's on our board of directors of Heritage. And then Evelyn Simpson Currington, who was a DC uh, composer who was artistic director when I first started working with Washington Performing Arts. I came in as music director. She was artistic director. Okay. Profound. And then actually, I, we had a lot of her music premiere when I was working as um, one of the um, one of the folks that was beginning to work with the NSO National Symphony Orchestra Outreach Program. It was called NSO in Your Neighborhood at the time, and the orchestra was going out into churches and around the city performing. And we did a con we did several concerts where I was conducting um, the choirs, and so we premiered a lot of her works with the National Symphony Orchestra in that program, and. Um, and then, of course, Deidre Robinson, who was a artist of, of Heritage Signature Chorale, prominent young composer. And then Rosephine Powell, who was on, like you didn't see those experts, but she did the second half of our program with a cantata that she had written. So again, just this wealth of information, we thought let's just bring the folks in. Um, and then you also saw a little bit of our earlier concerts with Brandy Sutton. We did a Porgy and Best concert some years ago. And, Brandy and Simone and Solomon, all these folks that were much younger um, were actually singing in that program. And now they've gone on to New York City and Manhattan School of Music and you know, of course Solomon's at Washington Opera. So yeah, it just got started that way. And then, because you went to Morgan State, right? Yeah, so, I did my undergrad at Morgan State. Uh, Nathan Carter was- the Yeah, which has such a famous choral program. I mean. All right. I just sort of walked into it. Of course, I grew up in Chicago and was just had some friends that had come out to Baltimore and just visited the campus. And it was such a nice, nice campus. 
And then I kind of wandered into the arts program and there the, there the choir was. Um, they were singing even during the summer months when I was there just visiting the campus. And it's this wonderful choir. I didn't know Dr. Carter before I came to Baltimore, but then once I got there, auditioned for the choir, um, then I realized he knew all of my previous high school choir directors. They were all in ACDA together. So he knew my whole story before I even was a freshman. I mean, that was in the summer months. So, because uh, I was just going to be in the choir just to sing and have some fun. And he put you at the keyboard. Is that right? Yeah. He's like, come on down. I need you to play. Like, how do I play the piano? What are you talking about? Uh, so then I started playing and then it kind of it went from there. So, yeah. And I, I wonder if I can ask Stanley, because uh, as I've shared with you, I've been so impressed with these. I don't even know what you call them, but they're sort of a panel discussion, sort of sort of a, a, a lecture recital. Um, it, it's, it's kind of a, for me, I think it's kind of a reimagining in the virtual space of what a concert can be and how it can both inform and entertain all at, all at once. And I wonder if that's, if you find that's the sort of uh, work that, that now having to work in this virtual space with COVID, that, uh, that Heritage has been able to, to branch into, to, like, to, to do a sort of almost more articulated uh, uh, intellectual discussion of, of, of all the issues that, that you're going on instead of just purely performing. You said it, you said it, that's perfect, that's exactly what it is. Um, you know, again, we have been around for 20 years and just so, you know, busy with performing, performing, performing. Um, but again, because of the mission of the group was originally to delve into the mission of uh, these sort of intellectual concepts, you know, certainly classical, one to focus more on the classical compositions of African-Americans and the whole operatic sphere. So all those were certainly more academic. Um, and as we pivoted, you know, in the in the pandemic times, we said, well, you know, that's the same thing that we <laughs> that's the same thing we can do now. Um, and on top of that, we actually have all this wealth of recorded material from uh, the choir performances that can elaborate. Um, and then surprisingly, the team of members that helped to put the virtual program together were members of the choir. And they always were singing and soloists, but then when we started talking, they all, they had these graphic artist skills and some of them were studying, you know, voiceovers. They was, they wanted to do marketing. They had, I mean, they had all, because we just see them in the choir, we're not really, all, all, we don't know their whole background, but they just, they just popped into this whole new thing. So the, our soprano solo is now is going to be doing, you know, our voiceovers for the show. And she's the one kind of searing the new, the new programs as we're planning. Never would have known she was very quiet in the choir, you know, very, um, very dedicated, but never let me know that, you know, she did all those things. So that was just quite a surprise that we had all the talent in the group. And uh, so we had the talent, we had the will, we had the resources of our recorded material. And then the mission was the mission that we'd already established some years ago. And, and during all the, these 20 years with, uh, uh, that you've been doing this, you've also been uh, late nighting uh, with, uh, with, with the in-series. Um, yeah, what, what I is think when I first started with that, I think it was kind of the same way. I one of the soul, one of my friends, Deidre Battle, who was um, a soprano soloist. Actually, she was a soprano soloist at one of the churches I worked at once I came to Washington. She was a section leader and this wonderful soprano. She was working on her master that Catholic masters in opera. So she had we would so we actually performed all these oratorials at the church because she could do them and. Um, then she got a call, I think, from Carla to perform in one of the series, in series programs. And they said, well, Stanley, we need you. Can you just come out? We need somebody that can read music to, or to read through um, the jazz songs that are going to be performed. Because, of course, Carla, you know, the in series always going off, off tangent. Didn't want to perform any of the well-known jazz songs. So all these new songs. But if you get a jazz pianist that doesn't. Reed is like, well, he didn't, they didn't know any of the new songs. They knew the standard songs. And then Carla didn't want to do any of the standard songs. So you had to read through them first and learn them and then play them in a jazz style. So she said, can, you think you can do that? I'm like, well, I'll give it a shot. And that was my first one. And been doing things with N-Series ever since. Well, and I think Deirdre told me that, that her first experience was actually with, Ma with Magic Flute. Who was that? Deirdre. 
Yeah, I think before, yeah, you know, yeah. as as Inseries does, you we you have an artist that can do one thing, and then you know you develop a new program and say, well, why don't you come over here and try this? So I never known Deidre to sing any jazz or anything, and so she probably just came in as auditioned as an opera soprano for Mozart, and then they liked working with her, and then created this new show. And actually, Deidre was in the um, and Deidre was in U Street, yeah, U Street, you're right. <laughs> Everything comes around. And so and one of the one of the things that uh, I, I imagine Carla had asked you to do beyond just to conduct and to be sort of a, a counsel. Uh, and I don't know whether she had been thinking this, but obviously you're particularly you're particularly well suited to to help in this role as well because of because of founding uh, Heritage Signature Crown and knowing what it is to start an organization is to serve on in series board of directors. Um, when, right. when did you join the board of directors? Oh, I, do, I actually joined just at the year of transition when, when Carla was um, was planning to step step down. So that was a, maybe that one final year when she was artistic director. And I remember watching your 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 um, your video and reading through your <laughs> as one of the candidates for <laughs> And here we are. And here we are. Yeah, well, I have to, we're going to talk a bit about um, this new initiative we're starting at In Series, uh, which is named for Mary Cardwell Dawson, uh, who who was a, a, a singer and an entrepreneur and ran uh, a company that she founded actually in Pittsburgh. I was I was just in Pittsburgh and took pictures of the the house and the marker where um, where she would had where she would have these amazing soirees with. Um, with Langston Hughes and Harry Belafonte and just everyone came through this house. Um, and at the same time, she had a classical voice studio and founded the National Negro Opera Company and then moved to the Washington DC. And they had staple repertoire that they performed and toured with Traviata, Aida, uh, and a piece. And I came to you and I thought I'd, I'd discovered, I'd discovered uh, the wheel and said, oh, there's this oratorio that she founded. Uh, the ordering of Moses, and you calmly said, "Oh, the ordering of Moses." Yeah, of course. <laughs> Which, like a lot of these singers that have been out there that that people don't know about, similar. There's this repertoire that you know deeply um, that that some of us are just discovering. Um, and it, 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 again, it makes you ideal. Have you have you conducted the ordering of Moses? I have. That was one of those concerts with the National Symphony Orchestra where we had the outreach program, and actually, I sang the. Uh, the tenor rest of the team at the beginning when in school because it was Dr. Carter performed it and okay. he did it. And I think that was the first solo I had um, with the choir. But um, I mean, I didn't do much solo work, but I did sing that particular one. And um, he, of course, knew it because he was a student at Hampton. And then our Nathaniel Dent was um, right. chair of the department at Hampton. So it was like this whole lineage. Amazing. First time I heard of it was, of course, at Morgan. And then when I when I had that opportunity to conduct the symphony, I thought, well, this is such a great piece. Why don't we just do it? And it was on the program. Yeah. Well, th that sort of brings us round to because I obviously this has been a year when we've all been figuring out the virtual stuff, as 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 you alluded to, and I think some organizations um, like In Series and like Harris Signature Crown have been able to use it as an opportunity to do our work with with greater depth and more intentionality. Uh, similarly, of course, this this year, this season has been one where where we've really been called to think in a larger way about about how we uh, include more voices in in our industry, whatever our industry is. For, for you and I, classical music and 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 opera for, for in series in particular, um, and we had already, and you and I had already spoken about, uh, been planning to start a new emerging a resident emerging artist program that would be exclusively a space for nurturing and celebrating the talents of, of artists of color. And then, uh, and we had decided to call, to name it after Mary Cardwell Dawson because she really represents the, the values that, that I hope uh, uh, the program that we create can, can, can sort of both enshrine and nurture in, these, in, in local uh, talented artists of color. And, and we had, I, I have to say, I had already sort of determined the criteria and this is how it's gonna work and this is what everything's gonna be. And in a way, COVID offered us a chance to step back and say, maybe I'm not the best person to be determining what the needs are of the community. 
And maybe it's a, there's a real opportunity here to step back and let the artists themselves, and that's what I think will make this program unique and, and, and give it its, its, uh, its, its specialness as an as a, as a initiative to let the artists design and let them, them uh, select mentors, leaders from the arts community that they want to, to have shape the conversation. And that together, these four artists uh, who have appeared in our season, which have been all over our season, so our, our community knows them quite well now, that they'll work with these mentors over the course of the next four months. Um, and I, I should say this is made possible by a grant from Opera America to, to have conversations about what the need is in the in the industry um, and, and what they would like to experience during a two-year program that'll just sort of give them the greater resources and the greater experiences to take that next step. Uh, and you've been kind enough to agree to help me facilitate it uh, as a board member and then as, as a leader, I, I dare say the leader working on, on these issues already for, for so many years in, in Washington, DC. So I was hoping you and I might talk just a little bit of, about that, about why about the inequity that exists in classical music and in in opera and and how um, we hope this 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 program can can create a, a space to a change space, shall we say? Yeah, I mean it's certainly the topic of you know the day. It's it's come up in um, through society in the last last year in particular, um, and of course as it comes up again, it's a reminder of the times of the nineteen sixties, and you know it's sort of. Kind of coming full circle one more time and even if you read back to in the bios of some of these composers you know art of daniel dead or undine smith moore you know mark bonds there was or even back further william grant still i guess maybe in the 20s and 30s there was a a big push toward artistic um sort of this sort of formal formal artistic um approach hg burley um all of those and then William Brand, William Dawson, mm -hmm. was then it sort of ran to a cycle and then sort of reverted. And then, of course, in the 60s, it sort of came back again. And then, of course, now here we are, 2020, kind of coming back around again. But, but I think that the, the big thing that's different now is that there is a big focus on intentional equity. So I think there, there would be pushes for equity you know, along the way. Folks would do things, you know, kind of sporadically. But it seems to be part of the national conversation now to be intentional with the equity. So this is a great, a great step for in series to sort of step into things that you, of course, have been doing throughout the years, but to just make an intentional platform for it. And that's, I think, that's what this will be. Yeah, I love how you articulate that. Uh, it, that that what's different this time is that our organizations in series, but I mean the industry's organizations are called to create systems that will support that will support a, a, a continuity in in seeking greater greater inclusion um, yeah. whereas before it's been sort of one offs yeah and you know well well intentioned i'm sure and of course i mean it's, it takes quite a bit of work to you know to keep it going and but the good thing particularly now is there is a plethora of material as you said you, you discovered the ordering of moses and i I've, I've been talking about Andy Smith Moore and then new folks that are writing things. I mean, there is, you don't have to go too far to find material that, that fits the bill. It's, it's right there. It's just a matter of how do you stage it? How do you perform it? How do you make it interesting? How do you keep it relevant you know, for the audiences? Uh, and then I think what's probably gonna be important in this phase is that how does it become more acceptable for even producers or singers not of color to present it themselves? Because that that was kind of one of the um, stumbling blocks, I think, in the program. That even though we would make it a point to present this material, it always seemed to be well, only the arts of color need to be siloed there. Yeah, and then that just sort of kept it sort of small. So I think I'm hoping this time we're saying, just as you would be coached to learn German or you to you know to coach to learn you know Italian. I mean, there are ways that other performers can sing the same material, uh, just to apply some coaching with some folks that are like resource specialists, you know, or, 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 you know, content specialists on that particular art form. So that would be my hope that we would see certainly black, maybe some of the black entrepreneurs through this program that would present it with, present the music with non uh, singers of color. Well, and this is, this is something that, that, that you and I have been talking about, um, 
but there there is a Something I've noticed is that there, there are a lot, there is a real pipeline. And we talk about the pipeline, the pipeline a lot in, in these conversations. And often what we mean is the pipeline of early childhood education, the music education, to, and that pipeline into performing careers. But I think there's another pipeline of performers becoming entrepreneurs, becoming going from singers to conductors to artistic directors of companies or going from being a vocal performer to working in development, to becoming the general manager of a company. This happens, this happens a lot. I would say of most opera companies, I, I don't have a number, but it's got to be at least 80% of them are led by former singers. And uh, as you've shown, there is, there's a tremendous current generation that, that through a confluence of, of what the Mets, Corgi and Bess and, and the, the, the murder of George Floyd and the sort of greater awareness we have around this we're now becoming aware of a generation that's always been there of amazing singers of color. And yet of the 160 some professional company members of Opera America, less than five are run by, uh, by uh, artists of color. So one thing that I hope our program can start addressing or create a space for exploring is, 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 is taking entrepreneurial uh, artists of color. And, and even before this, this Zoom conversation, you were talking to me about a whole host of composer performers in our own community, creating spaces where um, they can be, can be empowered to, to, to explore their own interests and that they can say, you know what? I'd really like to write a libretto. Okay, well, we'll find you a composer. I'd really like to compose. I'd like to produce. I'd like to direct. I'd like to explore what it's like to to raise money, God help them. Um, I'd, I'd like to, anything that they may want to do because I think the real change will happen if we get new leaders. Yeah. It's not gonna be uh, changing the hearts and minds of the current leaders is, 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 is a good ambition, but it's not the same as changing the leadership in 20 years and making it look different. Because if that leadership looks different then the stages will definitely look different. Right, right. And that's really where the decisions are made. I mean, it's, it's the artists can do all that they can to you know perfect their their art form and their presentation but of course the people making the decision of what's going to be on the stage is really where most of that is going to make for more prolific um presentation more people doing those kind of presentations uh, aside from collaborations of course collaborations are probably going to be a buzzword in the next year as well because it would take organizations that are focus in another direction to sort of take some people under their wing and develop a, an arm of the organization, again, like the, the Codwell Dawson program that is intentionally gonna to continue to develop material and because you need the librettist, you need to raise the money, you need to do the art for it, or you need all of that. So you're running little businesses, you know, throughout the whole process. Well, I also, I mean, I love what you said about collaboration because it's not just that, but also there are all these institutions, well, like you and I, I mean, you, you have a deep history and knowledge all already of of something like the the ordering of Moses. Uh, it's going to be critical that institutions that want to do learning, that want to uh, uh, redefine their space, do that in partnership with organizations that already have a redefined space. So. Right, right. And I think that's why I say the collaborative collaboration. But of course, the the, the forethought of having establishing. The program, as you've done, is kind of be, is key, and then to bring in the those collaborators. Well, Maestro Thurston, I am I am so grateful to be in partnership with you uh, on on this and so many other things. Me too. Um, me too. And you and you and I will be facilitating this conversation, and it'll go on for for the next four months, and then in June, uh, which is the same month, of course, where we're prevent presenting. Um, uh, Black Flute at, at, in Anacostia, and we'll be producing our second of the now annual Juneteenth concert. We'll also have the, the uh, exciting opportunity to, uh, to, to announce to the world what, what these artists have come up with in designing this program that will start, we'll start next year. Great, great. Looking great. forward to it, Sam. Thank you for being with me today, Stanley. You're welcome. Thank okay. you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.